I'm Kendra Perkins. I'm one of the librarians at the Bryan College Station Public Library System. And I would like to thank you for coming to our virtual author talk with Stephen O'Shea. Stephen is a Texas A&M University graduate who went on to get a PhD in creative writing from the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. He is the author of From the Land of Genesis, which just came out last week. And he wrote and produced the upcoming documentary, Hell or High Seas. We will be showing a trailer of the film a little bit later. And also we'll be talking about the book. Um, so we're going to start with uh, him reading from the introduction so that you'll get kind of an idea of what the book will be about. And then uh, after that, we'll do some questions and answers. So I'm going to yeah. turn my video off for now. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, Kendra, for that introduction. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that Kendra pronounced Glasgow correctly. Uh, when I first moved to Scotland, I thought it was Glasgow. So kudos to you, Kendra. Um, I also want to thank all you guys for tuning in. I know um, this pandemic-induced author meet and greet is not ideal and it's rather unconventional and it's not easy to figure out all the passwords and the links that you have to click to get onto Zoom. So thank you guys for making that effort. Uh, it means a lot to me. and. Um, I think it'll be worth your while. We got some exciting stuff we're going to show you tonight. Um, and whether you've read my book or not, hopefully tonight will give you a strong idea of what it's like and hopefully get you keen to pick it up or if you haven't bought it already, um, go find it at your local bookstore. So this is what we've got right here. The latest and greatest edition of From the Land of Genesis. Um, I'd like to start just by reading to you guys the introduction. This is a um, short story collection, so it is fiction and all of the stories stand alone, but they are all kind of connected thematically and also characters that overlap. Um, so it's supposed to read cohesively as kind of like a novel, um, but you can, you know, if you wanted to mix it up, you could pick up uh, from the fourth or sixth story in the book and start reading there. Um, and then it's also a great way to kind of break up your read so you can just read one story and you can set the book down for even weeks if you wanted to and come back and pick up another. Um, but to start off, just the introduction, I'll just read straight from here. And if you guys have a copy of the book, feel free to pick it up and read along with me. So I have not fought in a war and I've never served in the military either. This book then comes as a result of over six years of research, including dozens of interviews with veterans from across the United States, the United Kingdom, and the remote territory of Guam. All references to experiences of war are taken directly from those source materials and transcripts, sometimes verbatim. Depictions of veterans in the civilian world, however, of soldiers returning home and adjusting to their new lives are of my own invention. This collection, like all good fiction, is a fusion of the real with the truth, of what happened with what didn't happen, but is still truer than the truth. And those are Tim O'Brien's words from his How to Tell a True War Story. Some of these stories are true to one veteran's experience, while others are true in a broader sense, encapsulating themes that pervaded the narratives of veterans from across three continents and numberless wars. There's always the question of authority, though, one that I've asked myself countless times and that I still struggle with today. How can you write about war without having experienced it? And the only answer that's ever really satisfied me is the simplest one. You don't. Instead, you write about human beings. You write about their many complexities, their shortcomings, and their ideals. And by the end of it, you reach the same conclusions that I found at the end of every interview and at the bottom of all of my research, that even the most hardened among us and the most broken all want for the same things, all feel regret and shoulder burdens, and we all go to great lengths to remember some moments, to forget others, and to face, or to put off facing, the inevitability of death. But the beautiful part of it is that we can reach across the aisles that separate us by class or race or experience, and grab a hold of someone in an entirely different world and time. This book, for instance, connects veterans and civilians. It spans across two decades, encapsulating the longest war in American history, and counting. 
and it grabs hold of two worlds, the new world and the old, America and Mesopotamia, the land of opportunity and the land of Genesis. So that's just a little prelude into um, some of these stories and something that I'd like to elaborate on since I have you guys here is this detail of the book being a kind of hybrid between fiction and nonfiction. Um, and that all came from this question of authority in my mind. Uh, how can you write about experiences of war if you haven't experienced it? Um, something like war is an incredibly sensitive subject and very difficult to just kind of imagine and recapitulate. And it's, uh, you know, on some level unethical to do that. And so that's why I began conducting interviews probably about nine years ago at Texas A&M University. And uh, throughout my time there, I interviewed a number of veterans. I had access to interviews that were conducted with other, other veterans through the summer graduate research program. Um, and then I continued interviewing veterans, sometimes informally as I traveled around the United States. And then again, when I went to Strathclyde, um, I continued there interviewing international veterans because this was an international conflict and the second largest representation besides the United States in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars uh, was the United Kingdom. So they had a wealth of veterans in Glasgow in particular, where I did my PhD, and then um, kind of on in the surrounding areas as well. And so um, what you'll find is this entire book is actually based in the civilian world. So whenever we're talking about these interviews and the references to source materials, uh, they're either going to be flashbacks or they're going to be um, retellings of experiences that some of these characters went through. And like I said in the introduction, some of it is actually verbatim. Uh, a lot of these guys and women that I interviewed, you know, they experienced some incredibly traumatic things and their ability to, um, to talk about it and to speak so eloquently the way that they did uh, it felt wrong for me to even manipulate that on any level um, so sometimes what you'll find in this book is just kind of my transcripts you know uh, in the actual fiction so that's kind of a neat aspect of some of these stories and um, that's something that's really important for me to let all of you know and so at this point, I think we were going to open it up to a few questions. If anybody from the audience has questions, you can type it into the chat that's right in front of you. Um, if not, I think Kendra might have a few prepared. So Kendra, do you want to take up from there? Okay. So I guess um, kind of as a starting thing, um, what exactly made you decide to kind of focus on interviewing these veterans? That's a great question. Um, and to be completely honest, I actually just kind of got sucked into a research program at Texas A&M University. Uh, I was going into my senior year and I wanted to be a part of something substantial, something significant, something that could, you know, bolster the resume for applications to graduate schools. Um, and I ended up just getting swept up in what was called the after combat research program. And it was led by a Dr. Marion Idy at Texas A&M University. Um, and it lasted a full year. And that's when I really realized interviewing these veterans, um, this kind of disconnect, you know, between the veteran and the civilian world, because for me, and, you know, specifically, it was really poignant because these guys and women that we were interviewing were my age. So, whereas when I graduated from high school, I went into academia, um, you know, my peers essentially were going off to war and they were having these experiences, um, most of which I was completely ignorant to. And I was horrified by my ignorance. Um, but at the same time, I realized that if I was ignorant to that, you know, how many other civilians out there are ignorant to that? How many of my peers at university, um, even outside of university, are ignorant to the experiences that our veterans have endured in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and outside of those conflicts? So from that point, I kind of made it my mission to try and bridge that gap of understanding between the civilian and veteran worlds. So I started with uh, my dissertation at Texas A&M University was actually uh, three or four stories, uh, one of which the title and the namesake of this collection in its most, you know, nation form was uh, 
published for that dissertation. And then um, I went on from there and I just continued pursuing this subject and this mission. Uh, I spent a year traveling around the United States working odd jobs that I got off Craigslist. I worked at a Starbucks in New York City for two months, uh, interviewed veterans kind of informally as I went. Um, and then that inevitably led to me crossing the pond and going over to Scotland where I continued that. Um, so in total, it ended up being about six years of research, interviews, and writing went into this book. Um, and then maybe three or four <laughs> years after I kind of finished the book of just tweaking, uh, querying, and then finally having it published by Unsolicited Press. Okay, and you've got some stuff in the chat. Um, uh, there's um, hi from Jean. Thank you from Catherine. And then um, you've got a couple of questions from Ty MC. Um, was the initial idea always short stories or was there an idea for a longer form story incorporating several different stories? That's a great question as well. Um, it was actually for me at the time uh, the initial concept was always to stick with short form. And in making that decision, I was actually kind of following the path of a lot of, you know, successful writers from the past. So Ernest Hemingway's In Our Time was his first publication. That was a short story collection. James Joyce led with a short story collection. Um, a lot of kind of the authors that I revered in my early undergraduate studies and since then you know, they, they just kind of like to get their feet wet in the fiction writing realm, they dabbled in short story form. Uh, and it's a really great form for learning. And I'm so glad that I did that because uh, the vast majority of the stories that I wrote at Texas A&M and even my first few years at Scotland um, did not make it into this collection. So rather than starting on a novel and rewriting it from start to finish 10 times over, I was able to kind of, you know, pick the things that I liked from stories that didn't quite make the cut and recycle them and, you know, reuse them for stories that ended up being uh, really powerful and that really had a strong effect on people that were able to read them back then. Okay, um, and let's see, there's a comment from Catherine. It says, that's amazing, absolutely necessary to bridge the gap. You've got another question from Ty that says, what was your process in creating the civilian stories? Were they inspired by the veterans themselves or were you pulling from other resources? Well, there's, you know, every single story um, in this collection is somebody who experienced the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the vast majority of them were, you know, infantry, uh, kind of frontline grunts, but the only real civilian story is a embedded journalist. Um, so he still, you know, went to Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and you know, in that kind of indirect way, experienced a kind of trauma. Um, so the the approach to you know having all of these stories in the civilian world <clears throat> was really my way of allowing myself to have some sort of creative liberties. Um, you know, being able to completely construct the setting and the environment and then the civilian characters that veterans are coming into contact with. Um, but, you know, even a lot of the experiences of veterans that they have returning home, those are, you know, the, the vast majority of my interviews was actually about their reassimilation process and what their struggles were um, and what they had to overcome. And, you know, just, I mean, one of the classic interview, or one of the classic interview questions was just, you know, is there anything that people say when you return home that kind of pisses you off or that, you know, really disgruntles you? Um, and the one question that almost everyone across the board completely disdained was, did you kill anybody? You know, so you'll get some kind of just like point blank, black and white uh, questions like that and themes throughout my interviews. Um, and then there were some that were a little bit more ambiguous, you know, it's like every veteran's experience returning home was different. So you just kind of, on that level, that's when you dive into the individual and you kind of try to flesh that out in a fictional context. Okay, and there's uh, some more comments on here. 
Um, there's one from Barbara. It says, I just got my copy today. Can't wait to spend my break reading it. Funny, all this time I thought you were going to write about the interviews, not turn it into a hybrid. Looking forward to reading your words. Excellent. Well, thank you, Barbara. Uh, okay, and we have one from Dolan Banerjee. It says, hi, how did you feel when you heard all the stories from the veterans you interviewed, and did it impact how you wrote your book? Wow, that's a, you know, that's a really great question. Um, and one of the first times I really kind of confronted that idea was in Scotland when I was doing ethics training um, because they were very careful about sending me out into the field, you know, so to speak, and interviewing veterans and asking these potentially traumatic triggering questions. Um, and one of the things that they kind of had me confront myself about was, are you receiving secondary trauma from the interviews that you're conducting? And at the time, I thought it was kind of ridiculous, you know, like, how can you even compare being a witness in an interview context to having actually experienced these things firsthand? Um, but absolutely, whenever I write some of this stuff, it ends up being incredibly emotional for me. Uh, and I actually, I wrote a piece of flash fic fiction for my master's degree while I was in Scotland. And um, it was about a veteran's experience of uh, having to carry one of his friends whew, uh, who got shot multiple times in the abdomen to a medivac helicopter and I was just reading the story in front of a crowd and I started doing this I started uh, you know just getting really emotional and kind of choking up because uh, it's not you know it's not just fiction for 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 me or for these people who I interviewed. And, um, you know, whenever I write it and whenever I read it and whenever I speak about it and think about it, I'm back in that room with that veteran having that interview and having that conversation. And so some of that kind of sneaks up on me like right now, uh, but excellent question. And I think it, if anything, it made me even more cautious with how I was presenting this material. Um, and how I was, you know, paying service to the men and women who served our country. Um, and related to the ethics training they did, um, were there concerns with your talking to people, some of which are potentially um, experiencing suicidal thoughts and stuff like that? Are there like things you're supposed to do if they're telling you stuff? Absolutely. You know, in the interview, it's 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 mostly about just feeling out the interviewee um, and knowing what lines not to cross, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's a strange dynamic whenever, you know, you sit down, you have a .wav recording system that you're putting between you and the veteran and you're asking questions. It becomes this kind of like authority dynamic where, uh, to some people, they might feel like they need to answer these questions or like that they're trapped in this room. And so a lot of that was just, you know, letting veterans know that they're in a safe space, that they can talk about these things, but they can also choose not to talk about them. You know, we can uh, gloss over some of this stuff. And if it's pretty clear that somebody doesn't want to talk about these things, don't push it. You know, don't ask the same question three times trying to get to the bottom of something. This isn't an investigative journalistic piece. You know, this is uh, this is sensitive material that you're dealing with. And as the writer, I had responsibilities to treat it as such. Um, but absolutely, I think, you know, on some level, um, I couldn't just be bearing witness to some of their experiences. Um, but what actually ended up happening that I'm so grateful for, and I did not expect at all, is at the end of every interview, one of the last questions I asked was just, how was this experience for you? Um, and nine times out of 10, the veterans would say that it was cathartic, that they actually felt better having just talked about some of these things. Um, and I think that's really fascinating. I think on some part, people really struggle having those conversations with people that they're close to, um, with people who are you know, in their lives on a daily basis, because uh, they're worried about judgment or you know they don't want to appear vulnerable or weak and having somebody come in who you know you might not know that well uh, but you understand kind of what they're trying to accomplish and you understand on some level that it is for the greater good 
um, you allow yourself to open up a little bit more. And that's what ultimately most of the people who, you know, volunteered to be interviewed would say. They'd say they did it because they want to make sure that other people aren't experiencing the same things that they went through. You know, other people aren't feeling so alone, so ostracized, and um, just so alienated because they felt like they were the only ones going through that. And they didn't realize that this was kind of a very common and shared experience amongst a lot of veterans who returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay, and uh, you have a question from Taylor. It says, what's your favorite thing you've learned from writing this book? I think the thing that I enjoyed the most and that I found the most fascinating was uh, the sense of humor that veterans and that uh, soldiers and military personnel take with them to conflicts overseas and just in their day-to-day -day lives. It's a very dark humor. Um, it's very pessimistic, but it's very, very funny. Um, and it's, you know, you can see it as a kind of coping mechanism for some of the struggles and hardships that they're facing at the time. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of their humor and their jokes, uh, you know, they, they made me laugh, belly laugh constantly. And I feel like a lot of these men and women come out of the military with a really strong sense of humor that, you know, even as a civilian, I was able to appreciate. So just knowing that, um, that veterans, despite everything that they're going through, are able to, you know, nine times out of 10, come out of it laughing, uh, even if it's, you know, in the face of something. I think that's something that I, I appreciated. You definitely need a sense of humor to get through life. So <laughs> they seem to have figured that out. Okay, um, more. <laughs> there's like a lot of questions. Excellent. Um, okay, there's one from um, Jean Marie. It says, I love the compassion you developed over this journey towards many individuals with different issues. Do you think that empathy and compassion will continue to feed your career and pursuits as you go further in your career? Oh, definitely. I mean, that's, you know, I think that's the motivation behind becoming a writer for me in large part. And um, it's the fuel that keeps you going. It's, uh, you know, why spend six to seven years of your life writing about other people's struggles, you know? Um, I think it's because on a very deep and personal level, I feel connected to these people through empathy. Um, so absolutely, uh, you know, I think that that was a large part of our documentary, Hell or High Seas. Um, Taylor will talk a lot about empathy and moving forward for me, uh, between all the various projects I have, they're, they're all really about building up other human beings and um, empathizing with people who are in, you know, just unfortunate circumstance or, um, you know, just marginalized communities like the veteran community. Um, so absolutely, I think I think as a writer, it's your responsibility to not only have empathy, but to use it as a motivational force. Okay, and there's a question from, uh, I think that says Landry. Uh, what authors or books have influenced your writing? Oh, that countless, <laughs> countless authors <laughs> and books. I mean, uh, you know, I think one of the fascinating parts about this book is that you'll find individual stories are influenced by different authors. So obviously uh, Hemingway's In Our Time, James Joyce's Dubliners had a strong impact on me early on. Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried uh, was huge for me in picking up the mantle of this project. Um, but you know, also um, Olive Kitteridge was a novel that really moved me and compelled me to write from a female's perspective better, you know? Let's see, which one do we have over here? A message from the Goon Squad. That was a pretty classic. Just lots of really powerful books and authors out there. Um, and every, every story that I wrote, you know, would be inspired by three or four of them. And then I'd pick up the next few books and start writing another story. And um, I think that writing is half reading. So as long as you're reading good fiction and even if you're not reading good fiction, if you can take away from it the parts that are powerful and the parts of it that are good, um, you know, you should let it influence your writing and you should let it kind of sneak in there and leak into the various aspects of your fiction. Okay, uh, 
Um, and there's a question from Barbara. It says, since I haven't read it yet, did you interview many female veterans? So that's a great question because for me, initially I started with just combat veterans. Um, so to find a female combat veteran in the United States was incredibly difficult because they were not technically allowed to be combat soldiers until very recently. Um, so a lot of the people who I was actively interviewing had served years before. Um, so uh, the female helicopter pilots that I interviewed on Guam, thanks to Taylor Greiger, um, they were huge in my research and in my book. And then when I went across to Scotland, I actually had the opportunity to interview a Scottish female who had been a comm specialist on the front line um, and she had some terrifying experiences, uh, one of which they were sleeping in essentially graves, uh, holes in the ground in a tent because whenever they'd get rocketed, shrapnel would go flying through the fabric tent so they had to sleep beneath the ground so that they wouldn't get punctured by shrapnel. And she woke up in the middle of the night to somebody carrying her off. Um, so she was essentially being kidnapped and she managed to break free enough to get the hand off of her mouth and she screamed for help um, to the point that the kidnapper just kind of dropped her and ran away. Um, and so, you know, experiences like that are just on a whole nother realm compared to what men have experienced. Um, and I really wish in this collection I could have delved deeper into some of the female experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was just really difficult to get that content. Um, but I do have a few stories in there with uh, female heroines, so I look forward to hearing what you think, Barbara. Let's see, we have one from Dev Kumar. It says, what research did you do on the people you interviewed? Did you do you um, any research on them before you interview them? So usually uh, the way that I would conduct the interviews and find um, you know, volunteers for the interviews is through an academic system or when I was in Scotland or just traveling around, um, it was just kind of you know, whoever was interested in being interviewed. And so not really because it was entirely dependent on their willingness to volunteer for it. Um, so, for instance, at Texas A&M University, it was all about um, people responding to our advertisements and our email, you know, just kind of like sending out listserv emails across the board, um, seeing who would respond. So, most of the time when I sat down with somebody to conduct an interview, I had never spoken with them before. Um, the one exception of that was in Scotland. Um, there was a housing community out of Glasgow for homeless veterans that I volunteered at for a time. And so I was able to kind of, you know, get to know these veterans before I interviewed them. And then um, that was also very important because some of them, they were, you know, a little bit less likely to be uh, transparent and vulnerable in an interview situation. Um, so getting to know those guys before was pretty crucial. Uh, I did witness one kind of brawl between two guys when I was volunteering there one time. Um, but you know, when you've got a room full of veterans, it's quickly broken up by bigger, stronger guys. So it wasn't, you know, you never really feel threatened or anything like that. But, um, yeah, I think, I think that added to the diversity of the subjects that I was able to interview as well, because, um, just, it was pretty random whoever would reach out and volunteer to be interviewed. Okay, um, and Ty asked, do you feel that your interview style changed or evolved with experience? And if so, how or why? Absolutely. I think uh, initially I was a lot more interested in the, you know, the combat action, sort of like, you know, what was your physiological response to getting shot at? You know, that might've been a question from one of my early interviews. Um, whereas later on, I was entirely invested in and, and interested in how veterans felt, you know, returning home, what some of their experiences were, what some of their hardships were. Um, you know, es especially, I think, uh, while I was in Scotland, that was huge for me. Um, I made the, kind of the conscious decision, really, to pull away from the more in-the-moment action aspect of the writing that I was doing and focus solely on, you know, veterans' experiences returning home. So it was all a process. It was, a, you know, a huge 
evolution for me. And every time I wanted to change the script of questions, I had to get it passed by the ethics board at the University of Strathclyde. So it wasn't always fun and easy, but um, I think it definitely contributed to and benefit, benefited this collection in the end. All right, um, let's see, there's one from Lynn Nikolai. It says, I totally agree with the sense of humor being needed to cope. I totally identify with the dark but hilarious humor of most of the military men and women I've known. I am a female veteran who took care of the war fighters and a retired Navy nurse. I was in Saudi Arabia during the Gulf War at a combat zone hospital. They took care of many veterans over the years. They loved having someone listen to their stories. I wish I had written many of them down. Thank you for this work you are doing and for putting the stories out there to help with understanding. I truly appreciate your work and look forward to reading the book. Oh. Also appreciate your efforts to bring awareness to military suicide rates. Bless you for what you're doing. Thank you very much. That was so kind. And, uh, you know, that was one of my struggles when I was, uh, whenever I was on my road trip going around the United States was uh, this wealth of storytelling that I experienced firsthand but didn't always have, you know, my recording device nearby. Um, so a lot of times I just have to kind of jot down notes uh, and uh, I was fortunate enough to get the contact information of a few of them so I could follow up later on and keep in touch with them over time. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that was one of the benefits of doing this through academia was being part of a university definitely lent me some measure of credibility so that I had that platform to be able to record these people. Because I mean, wow, these, I'd have two and a half hour long interviews that you know I'd spend an entire week just transcribing it. And the only time I really absorbed the information was when I was typing each individual word onto a, a Word document. So um, all of that was huge uh, to my understanding of their experiences, absorbing it, and then um, being able to kind of, you know, let that marinate and turn it into a story that had a broader message. Um, and then there's one from uh, Jean, it says, you saw this PTSD with a lot of younger people. How do you feel about outreach that exists for middle-aged and Vietnam vets who still cannot talk about it? I feel such sadness for so many vets whose whole lives have been ruined by this war. Yeah, I mean, you know, Vietnam War was so rough. And to think that even while I was in Scotland, they didn't really have an equivalent. Their equivalent was the Falklands War, um, where really only a handful of soldiers experienced combat at all. Um, so the Vietnam War is so rough because, you know, in a lot of ways, those guys uh, shouldered the burden for PTSD uh, and allowed some of the veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars to actually get the help and the treatment that they needed. Um, but for somebody who's still, you know, struggling with their experiences from that conflict, you know, I'd say that's na completely natural. <laughs> That's completely understandable. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I'm sure they're aware of is <clears throat> everybody has their own coping, you know, strategies and techniques and whether it's subconscious or not. Um, but at the end of the day, um, understanding that there are people who have been through similar experiences is huge. Um, and we're so fortunate to have such a wealth of great literature that's come out of the Vietnam Wars. Um, some great cinema as well has come from those wars, um, and that's been the inspiration uh, for so much since then, even myself. So I definitely, you know, have the greatest respect for the men and women who served in Vietnam. And, um, you know, I hope that at least on some level, whether it's indirect or not, that they're able to garner some measure of comfort out of reading this collection and seeing that, you know, the experiences of post-millennial war combat veterans are, you know, even on par or similar to some of their experiences. Okay, and there's another one from Jean. It says, how did your book and connections with veterans an effort to bring more attention to this issue, what did you see as success and difficulties? Well, you know, I definitely think, uh, in the past few years, there's been at least more of a movement and I think general awareness campaign to veteran suicide rates. Every now and then I'll still come across somebody who hasn't heard the 22 veterans a day 
statistic. Um, and in case there are any out there tonight, uh, that's the kind of general statistic of veterans taking their lives every single day. Uh, it's around 20. And that rate has unfortunately flatlined. And I think that's a huge part of the reason Taylor and I went on our sailing expedition and created the documentary Hell or High Seas was because it felt like general awareness wasn't enough. Some of the first news campaigns that really came out about the veteran suicide epidemic, you know, they went, went mainstream in 2003. And here we are in 2020, and if you look at the rate of veteran suicides, it's completely steady, completely flat from that time. Um, so we're clearly not doing enough. Uh, there's a lot to be said about what we could be doing. Um, but I certainly feel, at least on some level, and a strong motivation behind my book was that there seems to be a growing rift between the veteran and the civilian populations. Um, and part of that is because a lot of younger people who are serving today <clears throat> have family who are in the military, and that's part of the inspiration for why they enlisted. Um, and so you have this kind of subculture that's being created uh, where really the only people who are enlisting in the military are people who kind of grew up in a military culture. And the, the number of <clears throat> civilians who are directly related to a veteran uh, has been shrinking over the past several decades. So it's, uh, it's just kind of steadily declining. And so, th so for me, that was like, okay, we live in a democracy. Veteran population makes up about 7% of the United States. So that's such an incredibly small percentage there. You know, as, as a community, that's never going to be enough to sway a kind of popular vote majority option so it's our responsibility as civilians to reach out and to bridge that gap and to help, you know, empathize with and understand the experiences of veterans so that we can be aware and so that we can use our voice and our vote to, to help these men and women. Okay. Um, and did you want to talk a little about how um, the book and the documentary are related to each other? Absolutely. I mean, I think I, I referenced earlier, um, you know, going to the territory of Guam, uh, where I inter interviewed female helicopter pilots. And that's because Taylor Greiger, he was uh, in the Navy as a rescue swimmer. He was stationed out in Guam. He went to high school with me. And we, uh, after graduating from high school, went our completely separate ways. He was one of those that went into the military and I just went into academia. Uh, we hadn't spoken for about seven years when out of the blue, he just sent me a Facebook message because he'd read one of my stories that got published. And it ended up being the namesake story for this book. It was the third part of From the Land of Genesis. And he reached out to me saying, you know, hey, this, this is powerful, it's real, it's raw, but you know, you're missing something. There are women out here in Guam who were helicopter pilots in Iraq and Afghanistan, and even out here in the South Pacific, and they have incredible stories, uh, and you need to come out here and, and interview them. And the reason that really, you know, stuck with me was, A, this was my friend. We were close friends in high school. I hadn't really heard from him in seven years, so for him to be reaching out out of the blue like this, it must be something really powerful. But also, B, um, he wasn't trying to solicit me to tell his story. And that's, you know, something that as a writer... Um, you become wary of people who want you to tell their story, right? Um, so the fact that Taylor was inviting me out there to interview these female helicopters really intrigued me. Uh, we arranged it, we made it work. I ended up staying with him the entire time. I was in Guam, he was a great host. We reconnected. Uh, and then we kind of came up with this crazy plan to set sail and to make it a mission to call attention to veteran suicide rates and to use Taylor's story as kind of a case study of even non-combat veterans. And that's something I kind of like to elaborate on because while I went to Guam to interview female helicopter pilots, I found that Taylor had a really significant story uh, and it felt like a story that was really underrepresented. So Taylor being a rescue swimmer uh, had technically never deployed 
to a combat zone. But he'd been deployed to disaster relief missions, you know, when hurricanes strike the Philippines, uh, some of his rescue missions in Guam were kind of gnarly because they don't really have a first responders unit out there. So if anybody goes missing or if uh, somebody, you know, gets swept out to sea, uh, the Navy was called to go find them and to go pull them out of the water. And so Taylor actually had quite a few really rough experiences. And when he was being processed out of the military, nobody mentioned PTSD. You know, nobody even kind of talked to him about it or suggested that he might struggle returning to the civilian world with some of the things that he experienced. And uh, that was really disconcerting to me. Uh, so then I turned my attention to this issue of non-combat veterans with PTSD. And I mean, PTSD isn't, you know, exclusive to combat veterans. Uh, you know, people just can have PTSD from growing up in a rough environment. So hearing that PTSD wasn't even addressed was really huge in the motivation behind our making this documentary about Taylor's experience returning to the civilian world. And then um, as I kind of delved into it, I actually found that non-combat veterans have been committing suicide at a higher rate than combat veterans. And that is kind of an anomaly when you think about it, but um, if you actually kind of like dive into this process, you know, veterans who haven't experienced combat aren't being vetted for PTSD when they're leaving the military. Uh, they also don't feel, I think on some level, like they're allowed to have PTSD. Um, because they didn't experience combat and they weren't deployed to a combat zone. Um, whereas, you know, some of the things that Taylor experienced just in the South Pacific were more traumatic than, you know, half the people who are deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan and sit on a fob for the entire deployment. So uh, just kind of like calling attention to the fact that non-combat veterans also, you know, have this issue and sh struggle with very similar things to combat veterans. Um, and then from there, uh, it was kind of just a wild ride. We, we wanted to sail, we wanted to bring attention to this issue. Um, Taylor pinpointed Cape Horn as the Mount Everest of sailing. So if we were gonna do this, it didn't make a ton of sense to just kind of sail around the trade winds, the kind of classic round the world roadmap that, you know, cruisers who retire at 75 by a boat and they can do that. Um, Taylor wanted to do something challenging, something that would really draw attention to this issue, something to be like, hey, we're not out here just kind of on a vacation. You know, we're trying to accomplish something here that very few people have ever done. Um, we set sail in a 36 foot fiberglass sailboat <laughs> that was 40 or 50 years old. Um, Taylor spent about nine months refurbishing it. And I flew down for the month of August and met him in Florida and we managed to get that boat in the water. Um, and then two months later, I believe it was about four days after I submitted my dissertation for the PhD, we cast off from Pensacola, Florida and sailed straight to Cancun across the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, why don't we try the trailer? I'm getting, I'm getting some feedback over here. I'm not sure if, if you are as well, but, um, why don't we use that as an opportunity to uh, show everybody the trailer? All right, so here we go. Expect in a pretty good storm tonight. Not one of those hit you and quit you types. Put her into the wet. There are waves crashing over the bow. got here with a dream that I've had since I was a kid, man. All I wanted to do was sail around the world. And I joined the military as a stepping stone to make that possible. After getting out of the military, I was diagnosed with PTSD. And it was pure hell. I ended up putting a Glock to my head and pulled the trigger. And it didn't go off. What am I still doing here? Was it a second chance? I wanted to show my buddies getting out that they weren't the only ones going through this. 
that kid loves with a huge heart. And to him, all the military guys are his family. So I took up an impossible challenge, sailing around Cape Horn to raise awareness about what's really going on with veterans. I put everything into this expedition. I've lost everything for this expedition, too. Boat's leaking, caught on fire last night, pushing her luck. I question myself all the time. Is everything that I've given going to change anything? You feel alive out here. You're working with the winds. You're working with the water. You know, she beats you down, but at the same time, she rewards you when that sun comes out. And it's just a ray of sunlight coming out over a glacier. That kid won't give up. <laughs> he won't give up on anything. You're not prepared for everything. All you can do is just take the storm and keep on pushing through it. Life is worth the fight. All right. So, yeah, I was worried the, the audio might not work or something. So that's my, I'm a, I'm a Zoom novice over here. So I'm glad that worked for everybody. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. That's uh, maybe version 12 of the trailer that we've come out with. So uh, it should be the final one though. And we're hoping to release that publicly here in the next few weeks or month or two. Um, so bear with us while we wait and then hopefully you can all be able to share that to your social media channels and everything. But that was a very private showing. And uh, I just, you know, I wanted to thank you guys for turning out and showing up tonight. And that was our special little treat for y'all. Uh, the production company that we partnered with actually, while we were wintering the boat in Valdivia, uh, we, we met them out of Philadelphia and they have just been incredible throughout this entire experience. They managed to send a team all the way down to Patagonia after we had rounded Cape Horn to film with us down there. Uh, and then they've single-handedly, you know, with the help of a lot of uh, Taylor's family and contacts and my Aunt Jeannie, um, we were able to really put together, I think, a documentary that is just gonna blow everyone's mind. And it's so incredibly moving the vulnerability that Taylor had and the strength that he had to share his story and to be the subject of this entire documentary. I don't think people really realize how much that takes, you know, from a person. Um, and it's entirely selfless because, you know, Taylor just put himself out there on the line. And, uh, you know, I think, I think people are going to see that. I think they're going to appreciate that and respect it. And I think it's going to reach a lot of veterans and, Hopefully, civilians as well. What are the plans for the documentary? Good question. We are getting the feedback again, um, but I can. I heard you said, "What are the plans for the documentary?" And um, it's been in post production now for coming, closing in on two years. Uh, we came back from our sailing expedition in February of twenty nineteen, I believe. So coming up on two years and we finished a rough cut of the documentary this past spring. Um, but of course the pandemic hit, pushed back all the dates that we had in our mind and our dreams. Um, we initially were looking to really release it at film festivals and go that route, but um, the virtual uh, streaming right now of film festivals is, is not ideal for us and so we're looking to establish a distributor. Um, you know, our ideal is going to be somebody entirely accessible like Netflix or Amazon and having it out there for the entire world to see. Um, Taylor and I, last time we spoke to our producer, they're looking at getting the documentary a release date of the spring of 2021. So we're really hoping that it's going to be out there sooner than later. I just want you all to know that it's all finished, the entire film. We had a composer write uh, the music for the entire film. We had this color correction company come in and do color, and they've done films like Dunkirk. So this has had the full Hollywood treatment, and it's just, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal film. And I'm so proud of the work that all of our team has put into this thing, and can't wait to share it with you guys. So I could just talk briefly about, um, let's see, my role in the documentary itself was, is kind of interesting because uh, when Taylor and I were first 
planning this entire expedition, we had a third guy who was going to join us and he was going to be our cinematographer. Um, and I was going to be the director, you know, telling him which shots to, to capture and to keep the kind of overarching story of the entire narrative in mind as we were <coughs> going through this entire expedition. And less than a week before we cast off from Pensacola, he ghosted us. We didn't hear back from him for probably five days. And then two days before we left, he told us that he wasn't going to be able to come with us. So I had to pick up cinematography, video editing, um, all the kind of gizmos and gadgets that we used on the boat. Taylor was our drone flight coordinator. And, you know, I think it was a team effort all along. Uh, when John Rose joined us in Ecuador, he would pick up the camera and he was very teachable and he loved, you know, being able to work with the camera and everything, but it was definitely a steep learning curve casting off from Florida, having to learn how to film, how to edit film, um, how to, you know, use some of this technology as we're on a boat, uh, half the time without an engine to recharge the batteries and the equipment. So it was a journey through and through and it was an adventure. Um, and it's a skill that, you know, I've been able to, take with me after the sailing expedition and been able to you know make a sh few short films and i'm working on a few short documentaries right now as well um, so definitely no regrets in that department uh, but it was definitely funny <laughs> having to pick all that up on the fly all of that was you know a really great experience and a lot of fun and i think it's all just contributed to making a film i mean when you when you talk about like a feature length documentary, one of the things I maybe took for granted as a as a short story author was you know this sort of I guess creative sovereignty. <laughs> but we got so lucky with the production team out of Philadelphia, uh, Fresh Body, because they're open minded, collaborative, and it really took an entire team to put this thing together. And I. I think moving forward, you know, I just have a renewed appreciation for film altogether because ultimately I believe it really does take a team of creatives and of passionate people, people who actually care about what they're doing to create a product like the documentary that we've made. So you talked a little bit about the documentary. Um, could you talk a little more about um, what it meant as far as the being a writer of it? Oh, and sure, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's my credit in the documentary. I'm the writer of the documentary. Uh, you know, and that's, I think that's in part because when Taylor and I initially started filming this entire thing, uh, we had the end goal of making it a documentary. We led into that by creating YouTube videos, um, and we had a kind of series that was on YouTube for a long time. And, um, but at some point, you know, you just realize you're a little bit too close to this project. I was, you know, I was a subject in the documentary. And I also, you know, had to acknowledge that there are people out there with a lot more experience in this, at this than I do have, you know. And while maybe my, my skill is in creating a story and, you know, identifying where the, you know, how to keep the tension and how to drive the narrative and how to create a message that's impactful, I didn't necessarily know how to make that work on film with the footage that we had. And we had like 150 hours worth of footage. So it was a huge undertaking to delve into all of that, to break it down and to create it into the documentary that we have. And that's why we signed on with Fresh Fly Films. Um, and our director, Glenn Holston, did a great job, uh, not only coming on board halfway through the trip, uh, he gave us tips and advice on how to capture the second half of the film, which I think you'll see when you watch the documentary, it was huge and super impactful. Um, and then more than anything, he pioneered, you know, the, uh, the post-production, the kind of piecing together of the puzzle that was our entire expedition. So as the writer, I kind of, you know, conceived the story with Taylor and we kind of shaped it through the film and the footage that we captured and Taylor and I both contributed to uh, the overall outline of the film and then I wrote the voiceovers that are in the film um, and so being a writer for a documentary it might not seem like it makes a ton of sense because maybe a writer for like a feature film would have 
a script, you know, like a proper script that they had created, which is almost the equivalent to a novel. Um, but it was definitely, you know, an undertaking that I think between Taylor and I was the better part of four years. Oh, do you have any other film projects or are you more sticking with writing books? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I definitely have enjoyed my experience with film and, uh, you know, it's something I'm, I plan on taking with me. I'm currently working on two projects that are film-based. One is a short documentary about my wife's mother, who's a paraplegic painter, um, and she has an exhibit up right now um, with just these beautiful landscape paintings, but every single one was a masterpiece. And, you know, a painting that I think even a fully able-bodied person wouldn't be able to pull off in a lifetime. And so, um, really, you know, getting behind Kathina and making her work and her story visible to the public was huge. And I think for her story, film was the right medium for that. And, you know, that's what we decided ultimately with Taylor's story. Um, and then I've got another feature length documentary in the works as well. Um, but as far as, you know, writing, I definitely enjoy the independence of writing. And so I think the pandemic, you know, kind of shut everyone down and I was really able to get back into my roots of writing fiction. And so I've started writing a novel. I'm probably 60,000 words in right now uh, and I'll be pushing on with that. It's, you know, a novel is quite an undertaking, but I hope to have something new for everyone to, to read and enjoy here in the next few years on the fiction front. Okay, um, and on some of the other questions that were on here earlier, um, Kathina said, other than the interviews and research, how did you check your own work for authenticity and accuracy as far as setting, terminology, etc.? That's a great question, Kathina. Um, we we're just speaking of Kathina, so there you go. Uh, um, you know, a lot of that was in consulting with the veterans that I interviewed, uh, keeping in touch with them, and then checking the transcripts of the interviews and pulling some of that verbatim from, from their transcripts, from their words. Uh, but I was incredibly fortunate after I reconnected with Taylor to be able to use him as kind of like a verisimilitude filter because I would send him my stories and Taylor was, I mean, phenomenal. He would, he, <laughs> I'd email him a story and he would respond to me with a text message usually within 30 minutes to an hour saying he just read it <laughs> and that, you know, he loved it. And then he'd give me feedback. Um, and a lot of it was just invaluable because there are little details like that where I might not be as aware of the mistake that I'm making, but if a veteran is reading that story and they see an inaccuracy like that, it puts them off to the entire experience, you know? Um, you know, a lot of that I was able to learn through the years and years of research and just kind of uh, really surrounding myself with some of these terms and uh, some of the, their experiences. But a lot of it I needed that kind of net, you know, to catch some of these errors and these inaccuracies. And so it was a multi-level, multi-tiered process of getting all of that proofread and checked for authenticity. Um, but you know, I think it was, I think it was worth it. I think it ended up being rewarding in the end, so. Okay, and then you've got a couple from Jean. Um, she was asking if there's any kind of book tour or events, uh, maybe you have any other like virtual ones coming up or something or? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think with the pandemic, it's really tricky because uh, on some level, it's irresponsible to hold in-person book readings and meetings and celebrations and launches right now. Um, so we have this, we've had a few news articles, a few news appearances. Um, there are a few local opportunities for me to really, uh, once the pandemic, you know, kind of gets to a comfortable place and a vaccine is out, we'll be able to host actual events. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. I'll be able to kind of sign copies of books for people. And um, all of that is going to be tons of fun but you need to do it in a respectful and responsible way. And right now with coronavirus is peaking, it's just not a viable option. And it's really unfortunate, you know, because that's kind of like the fun part of a book launch is being able to go on tour and being able to share your book with people in person. Um, so hopefully 
that'll happen sooner rather than later. I think uh, if the documentary comes out, you know, early 2021 or even later in 2021, we'll, able, we'll be able to tie some of those things together and we'll be able to hit the road with the documentary and the book at the same time. So there are gonna be opportunities for that uh, in the future. In the meantime, if anybody wants a signed copy, uh, feel free to reach out to me through my website and we can make it happen. Um, and she was also asking, uh, what's the best way to follow you on uh, social media and email and so forth? So uh, probably the best way to find me across the board is to go to my website. And that's just www.stephenjoshea.com. And there you'll find my handles to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's all at Stephen J. O'Shea. Stephen with a PH. Um, it's on the book if you have a book. <laughs> and you can find me across the board and I'll be posting about my book a little bit here and there, but not overwhelmingly. So you don't have to be worried about getting pestered. And uh, hopefully if you guys, you know, if you read the book and you want to reach out to me, I would love to hear from everybody, um, everybody that's read the book. So please uh, send me your thoughts, send me your feedback, send me your stories. And then um, just a couple more comments that people had. Um, Lynn Nikolai said, can't wait to see the film. And Kathleen O'Shea said, we learned so much about your work. Thanks, Kathy, Granddad, and Magda. Oh, yay. <laughs> and there's one from Jean that says, I look forward to renting out the Hoboken Movie Theater and filling it up and having you presented in my town. <laughs> I look forward to that too. <laughs> And I think she already logged off, but um, there was one from Catherine Mason with like a high five for Goon Squad. Oh yeah, that's a great book. Okay, oh, and one from Jean that said, I'm so interested in this journey you've been on and quite respectful, respectful of the book and sailing journey. Well, thank you. So. Okay. Um, well, I'd say, you know, we've, we've definitely had a good long hour and 15 minute gathering here. I don't want to hold, I'm, I'm so appreciative to everyone who's tuned in and uh, so grateful for y'all's attention and for your interest in this project and, and the documentary and the book and everything. Um, I definitely, one thing I, I might say is just right now in these times amidst a pandemic, one of the most crucial things is just, you know, word of mouth marketing and spreading the word about this book is so huge and essential. So if you guys pick up the book, if you enjoy the book, um, please share it with your friends and family. Um, this is, I think, as a movement and as, as a cause, it's something that needs to happen on a grassroots level and it needs to spread that way in order for us to see any kind of change in the, you know, the rates of veteran suicide, but also just the struggles and the difficulties of veterans returning and reassimilating into civilian life. So. Thank you all again. Thank you, Kendra, for hosting this and for doing such a wonderful job and for those great questions and for relaying all of them to me. So I appreciate it so much. And thank you everyone for submitting all those questions. We yeah. weren't really sure like how many questions we would be getting or not, so. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. I liked, I liked getting to answer everybody's questions. So, all right. Well, I wish you all a, a great night and a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>